Hey guys, just want to tell you a story. Um, Jesus told a parable, and it was about uh, a man that wants to build a tower. And he says, doesn't he first sit down, check if he's got enough money to complete the tower? Otherwise, he might start building. And he'd get halfway, run out of money, and everybody will say, huh, look, that guy, he started to build a tower, but couldn't complete it. Well, I want to talk to, to you about a tower that was started uh, in Italy in um, the year 1172. Foundation was laid in 1172 in a little town called Pisa. And they laid the foundation and they build, built the first two levels. I think the total number of levels at, uh, of that particular tower eventually reached eight or ten. But here it was up to two, and then they started to notice something. The, they had dug five feet into the ground for the foundation. And the foundation was a bit sandy and a bit of clay, and they found that one side of their foundation, one side of five foot down, was weaker than the other. And when they got to level three, it was already starting to tilt a little. Now, it was the, 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 the tower, the leaning tower of Pisa, was started in the year 1172. Uh, it got stopped a couple of times because uh, the town of Pisa was overrun by uh, two other towns. Uh, in, in those in the years it was building and the reason was that in those days Italy had little town states and the the stronger ones would sometimes come and walk into the weaker towns and set up their own government there anyway uh, as the uh, as that passed and they continued building this tower uh, they started putting more weight on the higher side so that that would force the foundation down on that side as well. Uh, but it retained its lead, its lean. And it was almost a meter higher on one side, once it was built, than on the other. The, uh, the government of Italy has forked out over 30 million euros, I think. 30 million American dollars uh, equivalent um, on stabilizing the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which of course has become a tourist attraction and has paid itself back uh, in a lot of money. But uh, if that hadn't been the case, this tower would have simply, in, in fixing it, would have cost more than the uh, building the tower cost in the first place. It took almost 250 years to complete. It was completed in the year 1370. So uh, 248 years after it was started, the building was complete. Now, why am I telling you this? I want you to, to, to come in to a place here in the book of Matthew, chapter 7. And we're talking about foundations here. <clears throat> And Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be a, like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. <clears throat> well, the foundation of the Leaning Tower of Pisa was, it's not the Leaning Tower of Pisa, it's the Leaning Tower of Pisa, was partially sand, partially clay, even five feet down. Anyway, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew. He's talk, Jesus is talking about the man who built his house on the sand foundation, and it slammed against that house, and it fell, and its collapse was great. So, do we hear Christ's words and act on them, or do we not hear Christ? I mean, do we hear Christ's words and not act on them? You see, if we don't act on the 
on the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're like the ones who built the Leaning Tower of Pisa. We are building with a foundation that is not going to support the structure above. It's not going to last for eternity. So let's go to our particular reading at this time, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and you'll see why I've brought your attention to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. 1 Corinthians 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. Remember, Corinth was perhaps the most worldly uh, uh, city in the whole of the Roman em Empire, as I mentioned before, to, to Corinthianize was to be extremely immoral in the most horrific ways. So the world and the world's um, morality had crept into this church. You are still worldly. How? For well, since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? In other words, you're acting like the rest of the world. You're not acting Christ-like. Are you not acting like mere humans? See that? You're not acting like God's children. You're acting like the rest of humanity. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? Just to be aware, Apollos was far more eloquent than Paul, but we don't have any of Apollos's writings. When Paul wrote, he wrote very uh, clearly and succinctly. Um, there was no waffling with Paul, but when you looked at Paul, uh, he, he wasn't the, uh, the most um, charismatic kind of uh, personality, obviously wasn't handsome, or you know his, his, uh, his presentation wasn't anything like Apollos's. Let's read on. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it. Now, you've got to realize Apollos was likely to be, the at that time, the pastor of the Corinthian church. Uh, but he's probably gone on as well. Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Yeah, thank you. Um, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Only God who makes things grow. Question is, when we do something for God, do we give him all the glory are we, or are we seeking glory for ourselves? That's something we mustn't do. All glory to God. It's God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You, Corinthians that is, you Corinthians, are God's field, God's building. Amen. By the grace God has given to me, I laid a foundation. And here we come to the foundation, guys. This is important. As a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. That's Apollos, and of course the church itself. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid. What is this foundation? It says here, other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Christ is the foundation that we build on. So when Jesus was saying, uh, the one who, who hears these sayings of mine and does them, is like the one who builds on the rock. Yes, they're building on the Lord Jesus Christ and on his words. Verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation, that's the foundation of Jesus Christ, using gold, silver, costly stones, that's one category, gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, that's the other category, 
that's the category that burns, guys. This over here is the category that is refined. But the other one is the category that burns when heat comes upon it. Okay, wood, hay or straw. Their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. What day is he talking about? It's the day of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that can't be far away, in, in my view. Um, when our Saviour Jesus comes again, he's coming to set up his kingdom. It's an everlasting kingdom, but uh, there's going to be a, an intermediate, uh, from what I read, and most uh, biblical scholars will agree with this, uh, an intermediate period called the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, where you and I, as Christians, will live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, At the end of the thousand years, the Bible says Satan must be loosed for a short time, uh, and he'll go forth to deceive the nations of the earth, as he does now. Uh, and those who side with him are going to be destroyed, and those who reject him and stick with Christ, they will be rewarded uh, in the new heaven and the new earth, wherein righteousness dwells. But anyway, the day of Jesus Christ will bring it to light. Why so? Because this world, eventually, will be um, cleansed with fire. It will be destroyed, uh, as it says in Second Peter, and its works will be burned up. It will be revealed with fire. The fire will test the quality of each person's work. Yeah. How can we build with gold, silver, precious stones? Guys, how can we build with things that are going to last? Well, that's got to do with your character. Has, have you allowed the Holy Spirit to do his work in you to make you somewhat Christ-like? Can you read um, the nine fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 and say, that's me because Christ has done a work in me. Do you have the love, the joy, the peace. I'm not saying that they can't grow in you. Of course it can. It can grow in us all. But uh, are you finding that God is giving his love to you for other people? The love, the joy, the peace, the patience. Oh, I struggled with patience. I'm getting a little better in my old age, but I struggled with that one, especially with uh, driving behind slow people. That was my bugbear back in the day. Now I just praise the Lord. Patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Gentleness is another one that the Lord had to do some work in my life for. Self-control, there's another one. Uh, all of these are the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Are you allowing God to do his work in you? Are you asking him for, for help in those areas? For example, the areas that I mentioned that I, I was struggling with, it's taken years of the Lord's patient work in me. God's patient grace working in me changed me from what I used to be. Hallelujah. Am I what I want to be? No, I'm not what I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I was. So I, our work will be revealed by fire. So that's the first thing, the quality. How do you build with gold, silver, and costly stones? That's what you want to be building with because that's going to last. First of all, the fruit of the Spirit is developing the gold, silver. He's he re refining you so that the gold will come forth and you can just shine like gold. And when you look in the reflection of gold, do you see Christ? Because that's what it's all about, becoming more Christ-like. As we, we look to our Savior, like in a mirror, uh, we're transformed into the same image, even from glory to one stage of glory to another, from glory to glory. So, yes, one of the things is your nature and character. Are you becoming godlike? Because it's through the promises of God that you are partakers of the divine nature. You become children of God. You, you are genuinely God's son or daughter. Okay, that's uh, one way. What's another way that you can become, what, uh, that, uh, that the work you do isn't going to, 
be wood, hay and straw that burns. It's going to be gold, silver, precious stones, telling others about Christ. Good works. You're not saved by good works, but good works certainly will get a reward in heaven. Not that that's the reason we do it. We do good works because Christ has done a good work for us on the cross. We are his, and so building with, with um, gold, silver, precious stones, good works, telling others about Jesus Christ, that's witnessing, um, fellowship, encouraging one another, and building one another up. That's all gold, silver, costly stones. And you can build on the foundation of Jesus Christ doing these things. You can also have the foundation of gold, uh, <coughs> of, of, of Christ and build with wood, hay, and straw. What would that be? Well, is your main motivation seeking um, a Zeus remedy? Welcome. Welcome. Um, is our main motivation, guys, is that uh, selfishness? Uh, is it me and maybe my family and everybody else I don't really care about? I've got my salvation. I'm, I'm not living an immoral life, but I, I, I'm of no real use to the kingdom. If that's the case, wood, hay and straw may be what you're mainly building with. Oh, hopefully, you're telling your, your children about about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and you're seeing them come to faith and uh, put their trust in Jesus themselves. You see, when I when my kids were younger, uh, we'd, we always opened the, the scriptures around the dinner table and I would read a chapter and we'd spend a little time discussing and praying. Well, that's building with gold, silver and costly stones because my kids, uh, the youngest one's just turned 21. We're having her 21st birthday at um, the Christian camp that I was managing for a while. Um, uh, she's gone into full-time camping. She loved it so much. Um, but uh, yeah, her 21st is uh, this weekend we're celebrating. Uh, but what, what, what we've found, what I always said to my kids, I said, God doesn't have grandkids. Just because your parents are, children, are, are Christians doesn't automatically make you a Christian, you have to develop your own relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't go on the coattails of a parents. And it's been a, a, a joy to see that my kids have laid hold on that. And now uh, they're having kids of their own. And, and the two families, uh, out of my five kids, two, uh, two families, three are married and, um, and two of them have grandkids. And they sit around the table also reading the word, or they'll read the word at a different time. But basically, they are instilling the truths that God has uh, into their, uh, their children, giving the truth of the word of God. So they are building with gold, silver, costly stones. But what we mustn't have is that they stay selfish. In other words, that everything revolves around themselves. We've all got to be outward looking. Um, we've got to bless others. That's what a servant heart is about. Jesus says you want to be great in the kingdom of God, become servant of all. Guys, if you're that, you become someone who's building on the foundation of Christ with gold, silver, and costly stones. Let's read on. Whatever you build on, on the foundation, your work will be shown for what it is. The day of Christ's return will bring it to light and it'll be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. And that's you. If what, uh, what you've built, character into your own life, your children's life, uh, others' lives who don't even, uh, may not even be a part of your family. If you've been building into them, mentoring them, I, I do my best to do that. It's taken me a long time, but my best to do that. With young people too. Just had some young people tonight. It's now 10, 15 in the evening. So we had some young people over. We had a games evening. But the aim is to encourage these youngsters to become Christ-like, to set their affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Okay, so 
The day will, will test what we will. If what we have built survives, the builder will receive a reward. Yes, there are rewards in heaven. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So your soul will be saved, you'll be with Christ, but the rewards won't be there because what you've been building is wood, hay and straw. And I would say every one of us <clears throat> has some gold, silver and precious stones that we've been building uh, every one of us has wood, hay, and straw that we've been building with. Uh, I'm not sure that the <coughs> the games of chess or Catan that I've been playing online um, uh, are gold, silver, and costly stones. Uh, they are basically uh, to give me a little bit of a break, uh, and but they have no eternal value. You understand what I'm saying? Don't let your whole life be that, where what you do uh, is... Uh, has no real value. Um, Jesus himself did come apart with his disciples for for a time to to take a rest, and that's important. Uh, and having some a game evening with uh, the youngsters is a good thing, you know, that we're building relationships. But what is going to last at the end of the day? Our being a blessing to others is one of those things. All right, let's read on. So if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved. And that's important. You're not saved because of your works. You're not saved because of what you build. You are saved because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. In uh, Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9, the Bible tells us that by grace you've been saved. Grace is God's um, uh, mercy upon us that we receive what we don't deserve. That's his grace. His mercy is we don't get what we do deserve. We deserve to be separated from God. And no, we're not, we don't get that. We have been, uh, we get what we don't deserve. Uh, and that's the grace of God. Uh, and that's fellowship with him for all eternity. In God's presence, guys, is fullness of joy. At his right hand, pleasures forevermore. That's what we're looking for in heaven. heaven we've got a new earth, a new heaven, a new earth got the New Jerusalem. I can't wait to go and discover all the places on the New Jerusalem uh, and have a wander through the brand new earth where sin doesn't exist. Uh, and, you know, the whole creation is groaning in travail, waiting for the revealing of God's sons. That's us waiting for us to, to, be, uh, to come into glory. And what's going to happen then? Well, the whole creation then will also be... Um, are released from the bondage that it's under. In other words, God's creation in the new earth is going to be an amazing thing to, to look at. We, we, we can see God's hand in creation right now. It's, it's still a beautiful thing. But imagine there where everything is perfection. No killing, um, but the, the life, uh, many of the extinct species that, uh, that, that uh, have... Maybe we'll see these ones, but the, the creation, if the creation is groaning, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, that the, the implication there is that it too will be restored, uh, not to be, to be uh, dying again. No, death only came into the world through sin, and there won't be sin on the new, in the new heaven and the new earth. Let's read on. That's, that's a beautiful thing. So, uh, guys, are you building on the foundation of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> In other words, have you received him as your saviour? And are you building with the right stuff? That's the big question here. Okay, let's, um, let's read on. Verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? Amen. And that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. So that's a, that's a, a warning against people to harm you and I, but it's also a warning that we shouldn't mess with God's temple and turn away from God. God will destroy that person. Well, God's temple is sacred, and you, you together, 
all of us as Christians are that temple. Uh, I'll just, yeah, okay. Verse 18, do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness. The wisdom of this world is foolishness. Oh yes, what's the wisdom of this world? Well, what are some of the sayings of this world? Uh, this, in, its, in its wisdom, this world didn't know God. But the wisdom of this world, there's a number of things. First of all, they they think they've done away with creation by coming up with something that doesn't work, and that is um, that is evolution. How do we know evolution doesn't work? Well, Darwinian evolution it was built on what Darwin discovered only uh, over in the uh, Galapagos Islands, where, where the finches, some of the finches had long thin beaks, others had uh, short stout beaks for, for breaking harder uh, seeds. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and these would change, but they all came from the one finch stock. And that's exactly right. That's called natural selection. Uh, and Mendel, uh, Gregor Mendel, uh, who was a, 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 a monk, um, he did experiments with, um, uh, with uh, flowers of a certain kind, and I've forgotten the, the kind of flowers. But... What, uh, what, what he discovered was that there is a gene pool that uh, all of these draw from. And every species has a gene pool. Uh, and you can get, for example, long-legged frogs or short-legged frogs, short-haired dogs, long-haired dogs. Um, they're all, they all can breed with one another because they're all dogs or they're long-legged uh, frogs like they, they can not all frogs can breed with one another but basically what we're saying here is that within the you can't go outside of that gene pool by itself whereas darwin thought oh if they, they keep on selecting for the long-legged frogs or the or the uh long uh beaked finches the finches those th those beaks could keep on growing forever for example if need be uh simply by selecting uh, two finches with the longest beaks, you might get something with even longer beak. No, it had to. It, that would be at the extreme of the gene pool. If you want a longer beak again, you're going to have to have something called a mutation. It would mutate for that. Uh, problem is, almost all mutations are either harmful uh, or they are... Uh, useless noise within the within the uh the dna uh, it doesn't actually change anything as far as we can tell um we don't see anything that is that adds information to an animal so we don't get for example evolution that takes us from um from microbe to man you know you uh, from uh um, frog to prince. You get it in fairy tales. You get it in the fairy tale of evolution, macroevolution. In macroevolution, we've yet to see. The evolutionary mutations that are always touted in school, and I did uh, evolution at, uh, or should I say, um, uh, anthropology, uh, stage one, at university, just to see what uh, what sort of evidence they could give us. Um, but uh, the best they could come up with as far as helpful mutations always took away the information. Uh, the blind fish in caves was touted as a helpful mutation. It was helpful, by the way. Uh, it meant the scales would grow over the eyes and the fish became blind. Why was it helpful? Because loss of sight didn't hinder those fish were, that were in the dark caves. Uh, in fact, it helped them because... Uh, their eyes wouldn't become infected when they bumped against the, the rock walls. Uh, and so the fish, uh, those fish with with eyes, died off because of um, the uh, uh, infection that they would get because their, their eyes um, 
uh, allowed the uh, the rubbish in uh, because they were damaged. Uh, no, the ones with the scales growing over them, they survived. And of course, because they survived, they bred. And so you had these blind fish in the dark caves uh, and in the streams. Uh, the same with bugs on windswept rocks in the ocean. The bugs that had the mutation for uh, short wings or no wings survived. Why? Because the ones with normal wings, when the wind blew, would blow them off the rock into the ocean and they would die. The only ones that were left on the rock were the mutations with short wings uh, or no wings. And so that was touted as a uh, a, a good mutation, and so it was. It was a good mutation. But what do both of these do? They they take away, they they lessen the information that's on the DNA. Uh, what we need, if we're going to go from microbe to man, is mutations that bring things like legs, that bring things like eyes, smell, you, you name it. All of these have to, to come through good mutations, which we've yet to find, by the way. We've yet to find mutations, good mutations, that actually add information. Uh, the information in uh, the, um, the microbe uh, is minimal compared to the information on the DNA of a human. So we don't have that unless God has created it. And you can take a look at the um, uh, all of uh, creation and you say, OK, what do we see? We, we see that every species is complete in itself. It's, it hadn't got um, a mutation that's halfway towards eyesight or halfway towards legs. They used to think that the, um, the coelacanth was halfway towards a, a fish that would actually become an amphibian because the coelacanth had these lobes and the earliest coelacanths uh, were already something like 60 million they lived around the time of the dinosaurs, 60 million years ago. And you'll find the early books uh, of evolution showing the coelacanth fish as uh, the forerunner of the, um, of the amphibians. Until coelacanth were found to be in the markets of um, southern Africa. And uh, when they were discovered there, they thought, well, where did these come from? And uh, off the coast, I think off the coast of Madagascar, you can find them off the coast of South Africa. You have these coelacanths swimming around where the earliest ones, and no different from the ones that were found the fossilized, by the way. And I think, hang on a sec. 60 million years and we've got no fossils of coelacanths and suddenly they appear here and they're not forerunners of, uh, um, of the amphibians at all. So, yes, we can invent these stories, but the wisdom of this world tends to become foolishness in God's sight. And that God created uh, becomes more and more evident uh, the more complex we see that life forms are. You see, um, Darwin thought the, the single cells that existed in, in, um, uh, in all living creatures would be reasonably simple. Well, they're anything but the little factories uh, that uh, that couldn't come about of their own. They, there's a definite design there. And if we go by the Bible design, we would expect that the uh, when God created everything and he ended up saying it is very good, and that includes humans, by the way, uh, that there would be no faults on the genes and no faults on the gene pool. Consequently, uh, what, hap what has happened in the meantime then is that back in the day, people asked, well, where did uh, Adam and Eve, where did their children get their wives from? But the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. And if there's no faults on the genes, then uh, uh, horror of horrors, brothers could marry sisters. Nowadays, we look at that and we think that's absolutely loathsome. Why do we think that way? <coughs> Because incest, you're going to get all sorts of problems happening with incest, guys. And that's why rules have been put in place in much of society whereby we can't marry our brothers and sisters. I think we are still allowed in, in this day and age to marry cousins. 
<laughs> but even that is frowned upon. But you take a look at the pharaohs going back four or five thousand years ago. The pharaohs married their sisters. As far as we know, no bad consequence. Abraham, the patriarch Abraham, married Sarah. Sarah was his father's daughter, not his mother's daughter. They had different mothers, but they both came from the father Terah. He had a, he had several children. He had one child by Sarah, but he had uh, others by uh, other ones. And Isaac, Isaac, um, he married his second cousin. Uh, Jacob married his cousins. And you're thinking, well, all of this incest, we can see how terrible that is today because there was an example <coughs> recently of the family over in Australia. And you take a look at some of their faces and some of the, you know, <coughs> pardon me, and incest has horrible results today. And we're right to think what a terrible thing that is. But back when God created the genes, there was nothing wrong on the genes and uh, nothing bad happened when they married their cousins. Go uh, By the royal family, on the other hand, uh, the royal family of Europe, the royal families of Europe were very much <clears throat> marrying one another and there was a lot of incest there. And you take a look at the offspring uh, of Queen Victoria. Uh, they married among the, the Tsars of Russia. And the Tsars of Russia, uh, they drew the short straw, so to speak, and you got haemophiliacs, bleeders, ones who, if they cut, they wouldn't stop bleeding. <clears throat> or found it very difficult for the clotting to happen uh, before they were destroyed by the Bolsheviks, of course, communists. Um, but back in the day when God had recently created humanity, none of these faults were there. And people lived longer as well. Nowadays, so, so yes, do I, when people ask me, do I believe in this wisdom of the world? evolution. That's one of the foolish ones. Uh, when when I believe, do I believe in evolution? I say, well, yes, it's a downhill one. It's not up to bigger and better things. It's, it's going downhill because we're getting more and more faults on our genes. <coughs> in fact, scientists say, unless something is done about it, the human race may only have another 500 years before it becomes so, uh, the faults on our on our genes become so numerous that we're, we're no longer a viable species. Interesting that, isn't it? They can see the downhill progress, and yet they don't, it doesn't come into their mind to, to imagine, let's go back a bit. Uh, so less and less faults on the genes. If we go back a few thousand years, <coughs> that doesn't come into their head. Why? Because they don't want to believe in God. The wisdom of this world is foolish. Yep, we're trying to uh, change God's creation and say, um, when God creates man and woman, um, he, he's, uh, he's made a mistake in some cases, and some people get the wrong body. Well, that's another wisdom of this world. And the sad thing is, <clears throat> you take a look at this whole transgender um, thing that they're trying to foist on humanity, and I'm talking about our Western leaders and the Western education. I'm a school teacher, and it disturbs me. Uh, encouraging children to, to, to make up their own mind whether they're boys or girls. They don't tell you the other half of the story, guys. They don't tell you that 40% of those, <clears throat> whether they've had the operation or not, but 40% of the ones who consider themselves transgender or, or go that path attempt suicide. Fully 40% attempt suicide. 41% if you want it exact. Uh, that's the British study. Yeah, and that's the wisdom of this world. 
instead of say, recognizing that it, here we have a problem, uh, we, we, rather than saying, guys, let's get away from the wis this, this wisdom of this world, they embrace this stuff. Do they care for our children? No, they don't. They don't care for our children. Education department. We have to do the caring for the children, guys. We've got to see that, uh, you know, we, we show the love, we show the compassion, and we show them <coughs> that God doesn't make a mistake when he created you. You are made in the image of God. And even if you've had an operation, you are still, the real you inside, are made in the image of God. And you can come to God. You can still be saved. Um, it doesn't matter what you think you've become. God loves you. We've got to let people know that, guys. Because there's a whole community of people that struggle with their identity. But we've got a true identity in Christ. We've got a lovely, a beautiful identity in Christ. Yeah, the wisdom of this world, yes, it is foolishness. Not just in God's sight. It is absolutely foolishness if you just take a look at where it's taking us. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness or in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. <clears throat> so they're no more boasting about human leaders, guys. All things are yours. Whether Paul, Apollos, Cephas, that's uh, the that's uh, Simon Peter is also Cephas. Paul, Apollos, Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. Amen. We are in Christ. We've been made righteous. We have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So thank you guys for uh, for listening. And I, I know that most of you are followers of Jesus Christ. That's just awesome. Um, so uh, and thank you guys for, for following. Much appreciated. Uh, so we've come to the end of this one. I'm going to answer some of your questions. Hallelujah. Um, yeah, thank you, Jamie. I appreciate that. May the Lord continue to guide his fold. Amen. Sunshine and games. Uh, amen. Jamie, uh, again, thank you for sowing more seeds of the word and the bread of life. Anyway, I saw your Christian tag and wanted to say hi. <coughs> Time to get you for me to. Time for me to rest. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And guys, that is exactly it. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's show how empty are the lies that the, the media says about Christians, you know, that we are bigots and haters uh, and um, narrow-minded. Well, in, in a sense, we're narrow-minded. Of course, we're on the narrow way. But that we're bigots and haters and intolerant and so on and so forth. Let's show that that is not the case, that we are loving, that we have open arms for all the hurting. No matter what they've turned themselves into, let's be those who shine the light of Christ because all men can be saved. All men, all women can be saved uh, if they'll simply turn to Christ and ask the forgiveness that he so, so willingly offers us. So thank you guys. Thank you for, for joining me. Uh, I'll <clears throat> I'll go down to Discord if you want to uh, join me. Just go scroll down uh, in my in Mark's uh, uh, in Mark's cafe for a short time, but it is ten thirty nine here, um, and so I I too I've got to go to school tomorrow, so I too should be getting off to bed. But I will go down to Discord. So if anybody wants to join me there, you are more than welcome. Thank you for joining me this uh, this evening, and may God bless you all. <laughs>